Hello, and welcome to the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios at the National Press Foundation. Today we're talking about cybersecurity with Heather Dahl, co-founder of the Sinja. The National Press Foundation is a nonprofit dedicated to helping journalists cover complex topics with depth and accuracy. Our mission includes journalists around the U.S. and around the world. I'm Sandy Johnson, president of the National Press Foundation. With me today is Heather Dahl. Heather is co-creator and CEO of The Sinja, a multi-platform media company focused on introducing kids to the world of technology. Heather was a broadcast journalist for 15 years and provided technical research and on information security for Newstar. NPF is also fortunate to have Heather chairman of our board of directors. Target, Sony, Home Depot, and J.P. Morgan Chase. These were massive hacks that got plenty of media attention. Uh, journalists like their devices. We like our wireless devices because they help us do our work. What statistics do you have about hacks of corporations and individuals that you can share with us? Well, last year Verizon issued what they call their Data Breach Investigations Report, and it showed 63,000 incidents um, with businesses um, in about 95 countries. And then you have to look at what Identity Theft Info is reporting, and they're saying approximately 15 million Americans had their identity stolen fraudulently, and what we know are that kids are 50 times more likely to have their identity stolen than adults. Why? Because people don't think about monitoring their children's identity. And then you add on top of that, 100 million Americans have had what we call their personally identifiable information, their PII, exposed as a result of data breach compromises. So, I mean, it's not, it's not stopping. And one of the interesting reports that came out of Australia this week is that their law enforcement agency is reporting that fraud offenses committed by those under the age of 18 has increased by 26% in the past two years and 84% over the past three years. So really, seeing these numbers in the younger generations, there's no reason to think that these crimes won't continue to escalate because the fact is right now, cybercrime pays and the rewards heavily outweigh the, the risk, really, the likelihood of being caught by a, a, for, for a cybercrime is far less than being caught for a serious crime. And there's really a low cost of entry into this world. Uh, you don't even need complicated tools to hack into some complex systems. And what we can see in Australia, clearly teenagers are able to buy these tools. So what we have to remember, what we have to think about, is this is a problem. Cybercrime is a problem that is not going away anytime soon. So we have to think about how are we going to deal with this threat in our daily lives, at home, and at work. Heather, a recent survey mm -hmm. found only 44% of people in the United States set a PIN or passcode on their phone. Walk us through how okay. to lock a device. Absolutely. Um, a PIN or passcode on your phone means before you're allowed to open and engage with the applications in your device, you have to hit a number. And then you can swipe your device open. Um, people think, oh, you know, half of us don't have pens, and I'm here to tell you, yes. I, I believe the statistic, just three weeks ago, I was at the National Press Club um, talking with some fellow journalists, um, and three of them went to show me something on their device and opened it right up. No ability to unlock, like, just swipe open. So why is setting a passcode important? Because if you lose that device, guess what? Anyone else can just swipe it open. So how do you set the passcode? What you want to do is go into your device and there's a settings option. Hit the settings. Depending on the device you have, whether it's an Android, Blackberry, iPhone, you can find the set passcode under passcode, security and screen lock, um, screen lock. Um, all those type of words would mean hit that button, go in and it will ask you to pick a four digit pen just like your ATM bank, um, but hopefully not the same, not the same code. Pick your four-digit PIN, set it, and every time you go to open your device, you have to hit the PIN code to do so. You can also choose how long um, it, you, the phone waits until it locks. So you can say, okay, after a minute, I want you to lock it. After four minutes. Why is that important? Let's say you're a reporter, 
you're in the scrum, you can't be unlocking your device every minute. Well, then, then pick a number where it's more like every five minutes. But at least you know at some point your device is going to lock, or you choose to extend the length of time on the lock when you're on the job, and when you get off the job, then you put it back and say, okay, it's a minute. Um, you know, when a device is stolen, every minute counts. So if you can have it lock sooner than later, it's just gonna help prevent someone getting in and getting some information you may not want them to have. For instance, your sources. Can we talk about that a little yeah. bit more? Like reporters, I, I'm sure yeah. most of them think, nothing that I have in my phone is that important, but they do have sensitive information whether they realize it or not. Right, mm -hmm. I would say most reporters cover something that those details are of, of interest to someone else that they may not want. So in this town, we have reporters that cover the Pentagon, Capitol Hill, the White House, different agencies, and you're telling me that no one wants information on your sources, on those beats, that that is not vital information for someone else that's easily swiped out of your bag. And it doesn't have to mean, oh, it's another source of someone trying to figure out. It can be anyone. Because the fact is, you probably have a byline. You may have your face on a TV camera. You may be engaging in social media. You've announced to the world that, for instance, I cover Congress. I interview congressmen. People know that you have sources beyond those congressmen, and if you do, you probably have their phone number, their emails, logs of your conversation, communications, photos, and you don't think that's going to be attractive to anyone else out there? And those can be protected with a simple can, absolutely. pin or password. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the thing to remember, it's not just your reporter's notebook that you're protecting. It's also your personal information because you, as a journalist, more than likely at some point in your career will become a target of someone else, either out of sheer curiosity or perhaps you're reporting a story that they don't like. And so maybe swiping your identity might be a great way to um, pay retribution for what you're doing. People can get that right out of your device. You can get credit cards. They can get pictures of your kids. Think about how much you store in there. Someone wants it. We all laugh at people who have ridiculous passwords oh. like one, two, three, four, five, six, or the yes. word password. Yes. Do you yes. have some yes. suggestions for people f to for for uh, passwords or pass yeah. phrases, as you call them? Pass phrases. You know, I got in a debate on social media about a month ago with another journalist who basically told me passwords don't matter. So I can only imagine what her password is. But I'm here to say, yes, passwords matter. In fact, for journalists, it's not even a password. It's what we call a passphrase, which is basically a string of words combined with characters and letters. So let's say your password, and this should not be your password, is ice cream. OK. That's really a weak password, and that's embarrassingly bad. So let's say you've amped it up, and it's two, ice cream four, exclamation point. Well, that's still pretty weak. But how about this? One, ice cream, four, chocolate, exclamation point, star, cone, two. You know, I'm, so I'm seeing here, so you can remember, you know, I like ice cream, I like chocolate, and a cone. So you have something in your head. The important thing here to remember is if this passphrase is based on something like your pet, your dog, um, something that's in social media, people can, there's so many passwords that are based on dog names. So those are things people can figure out. So you want to make sure that your passphrase is actually personal to you and it's not available in the public sphere. So the rule is they need a number? They need Ember? some um, uh, an uppercase letter, or case letter, letter. and um, a, a character. A character. A character. Mm -hmm. um, the important thing to remember is you've set set the password, and people will say, "Well, why do a passphrase?" 
it's just going to create more difficult for me. I can't remember all these letters and numbers. But here's the fact, is when someone is cracking passwords using brute force, it's a lot easier to crack a password, one, two, three, than it is to crack your passphrase. A lot of time, they don't want to spend time trying to figure out what your passphrase is. And they know that there are other people out there that are using password one, two, three, and they're going to move along to them. So I'm not saying having a passphrase is going to make you 110% secure. What I'm saying is actually it's going to buy you probably more time before your, your accounts are compromised. Think about it this way. You have a front door. Many of us have deadbolts on our front door. We know that ultimately maybe someone can go in the back window and steal our flat screen TV, but the chances of them doing that with the deadbolt reduce because what if our neighbor just had a simple little doorknob? A cyber criminal is going to go over the simple little doorknob and break in that house before they're going to spend time trying to get into your deadbolt, trying to go through the back. So what we're trying to do is actually make it more difficult to break into your accounts. Cameras can work against us in a couple yeah. of different ways. Let's talk first about hybrid, cyber thieves can spy on you through your device's right. cameras. Right. So let's think about what these cameras are about. They're a software program and an IP address. The device part just happens to be a camera, which actually makes it more um, scary when they break in. But when you have a device, when you have a software application and you have an IP address, that can be cracked, that can be broken into, that can be compromised. So what they do is they can actually get into the software, and in some cases we know that they're actually recording, monitoring, perhaps even interacting with the person on the other end um, of the camera. So here's what you need to do. We have these monitoring, whether they're baby monitoring, we're monitoring our dogs at home, or even in the newsroom. We have these cameras in edit bays and other rooms in the coffee room, just so we can collaborate and work better. Here's what you have to remember. When you set up that camera, your manufacturer often provides a login and a password to set up the device. That is often not just unique to you. It's something that they give a lot of people, and cyber criminals will figure out what these generic login and passwords are. So you actually need to go into their software application and change your login and password. And while you're at it, if, it, if you can, change the port that your camera uses too. And if you need help with on that, just do a web search on changing ports, or even ask your IT help person. And you know what's funny is ultimately on these IP camera attacks, your last line of defense is a post-it note. Because let's say they do get in and you're not engaging with the camera, the post-it note makes sure that you're not a star of your own TV nightmare. So put the post-it note right, right over the little camera. Absolutely. Right. Let's say you're on the other side of the camera. What types of things should you watch out for in the background mm -hmm. when you're taking a photograph? We just saw an uh, image float through social media this week where a source was interviewed with all his social media passwords displayed in his cubicle. Okay? <laughs> I, we saw it with our own eyes. And you know what's sad? That's not the only case that I see like that. So as a journalist, you have to remember whether it's you, you're interviewing a colleague in your newsroom, or you're interviewing for someone for a story, what do they have on their desk, in their cubicle, and the work environment? Do they have passwords? displayed on their cubicle. And let's hope that they're not doing this in the first place, but if they are, ask them to remove it. What's on their desk? Is it a bank account statement? Um, is it something that shows their street address, their home address? Is it something that might have a social security number on it? You may not immediately see it because you're looking at the focus point, which is the person you're interviewing. But that's not what the cyber criminal is looking at. They're looking at everything else around the image. The other thing to think about is many of us have pictures of our kids on our desk. And you have to ask yourself as a journalist, is my source's child's photo a part of the story? Chances it's not. It's just something that they have on their desk. So remove it. Why? Because sources um, who may attract a certain amount of interest or importance are often targets of spear phishing. And what does that photo of their child in the soccer uniform in front of a particular school allow for? Someone who's up to no good 
finding out some very particular sensitive information about your source, and then spear phishing them. They would send an email to the source saying, hey, here's Timmy's soccer schedule for the next six weeks. Your source clicks on that soccer schedule, but it's not a soccer schedule, it's actually malware. And how did they do that? Because they saw that child's photo on your source's desk during the interview, saw the information, was able to take that and make a spear fish and direct it to your source. So it's things like that you have to think about. Going to the point of journalism, was that, was that photo of the child absolutely vital to telling the story that you were interviewing that person about? Probably not. Probably so not. Remove it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's talk about malware. Mm -hmm. uh, the um, the people that perpetrate malware are getting more and more sophisticated. Absolutely. You know, th yeah. they learn how to spell things correctly. And so, what tips do you have for yeah. people when they get a, a message in their inbox that looks a little suspicious? Read it. Really read it. Uh, I call malware the gift no journalist wants to receive, and the fact is we're going to get this gift if it's, we don't get it today, tomorrow, um, and it doesn't always go in your spam box. So people say malware. You'd be surprised how many people don't really read their email. They glance on it, they just click and move on. Uh, malware actually hopes that you don't read it. What they'll do is they'll send it to you from maybe someone that you've interviewed before, and. They may know that because they read your stories or watch your stories. So you may see, okay, this comes from, but that person seems slightly misspelled, but you don't catch it because you're not reading it. Then you look at the note and it may sound weird. That doesn't sound like it comes from them. Oh, but they're sending me a photo or they want me to click on a link to donate to their cause. Well, what you don't know underneath that is it's actually not taking you to the destination you expect. So you need to check the URLs on the links. How do you do that? You can hover your cursor. It'll show you the URL. You can right click on properties and look at the URL. But even then, you actually have to read the URL because they're sneaky. These cyber criminals are sneaky. And they will make the destination look as much as they can official. Maybe they'll miss a letter, they'll have a small typo, or what we also see is they put a lot of numbers in there to make it look important. The other thing to look at is, you know, what, the, what you call the GTLD, the .com, the .net, but there are particular ones that you kind of have to question, and that would be .ru, .kz. Do we think that the, the link that you got really is in Russia? If you're working on a story about Russia, maybe. But you have to look at those um, URLs and say, I don't think that's the place where I should go. Don't click. Don't find out. Just let it be deleted. So be a little suspicious. Be a little paranoid. Well, you know, <laughs> as journalists, that's our job, right? Nothing. We look at things and we're like, ah, I don't think that's necessarily what's... Be the same way with your, with your email. Be the reporter that you are out on the beat when you're reporting stories and use, use that talent that you have on your email because it could save you a lot of time and a lot of frustration in the end. Public Wi-Fi. It's yeah. everywhere. It's so convenient. So convenient. What Change are the, jobs. What are the pitfalls for journalists and other people? Yeah, public Wi-Fi. I mean, you can work on your story pitch while waiting in line for coffee. It's brilliant. But here's what you have to remember about public Wi-Fi. Is it's also a target for people who are up to no good. Why? Because they can basically capture the data that you're transmitting. How? Because public Wi-Fi is meant for a variety of devices, a variety of applications. So as a result, they don't have the normal safety and security features that you would have, let's say, in your newsroom Wi-Fi. And that's just because you don't want hundreds of people having troubles trying to access the Wi-Fi. So here's how to think about public Wi-Fi. Don't use it. Okay, that's not really going to work for <laughs> us, but okay. So if, if you say, I need to use this public Wi-Fi, think about what you're typing. Is this something, that if it were captured, it's okay to share to the world? For heaven's sakes, don't be doing your banking or working on your retirement accounts on public Wi-Fi. Do your financial transactions in a secured network. 
um, wait that 30 minutes to do your online banking and don't do it at Starbucks or at the airport. Um, the other thing is, is you may just want to invest in your own personal hotspot. Think of it as the cost of doing business as a journalist. So you have the ability to get off the public Wi-Fi when you are at the airport um, or you're at your favorite coffee shop or at a restaurant. It just gives you that extra layer of security. And given the stories that we write, um, the interviews that we conduct, that's probably a very good investment. So worst case scenario, your device is stolen. What do we do now? Yeah, you, you lift their heart out of your stomach is <laughs> what you do. So at this point, I have really, really, really hope you have that four digit pin and your device is locked, okay? Um, because every minute counts. And if you know your device is gone, remote wipe it. And what do I mean? I call it the nuclear option. You got to push the trigger. So how do you do that? A lot of news organizations, IT people, have the ability to do this for you. You may want to check with your IT help desk to make sure that your work device is enabled to do that and they can remotely wipe it. Let's say you're an independent journalist, you work for a small newsroom and you don't have that support team, set up a remote wiping capability. Um, on our blog, on the NPF site, we have a list depending what device, whether you're using an Android, an iPhone, a Blackberry, on where you can go to actually set that up. And what you would do is you'd go to a website and basically say, wipe it and it's done. Your device is cleaned out. And so the hope is if they do crack your password code and get into the device, at that point there's nothing left for them to have. Let's talk about the Sinja for a minute. Yeah, yeah. The internet is dangerous for kids too. So tell us what you've discovered about children and internet security um, in the time that you've been working on this series of books. What I discovered is many kids don't understand that not everything is safe in cyberspace. And, and look, at, look at the experience they have. They get to play awesome games, they get to watch videos in this wonderful device. What could be dangerous about that? And the bottom line is, we're not actually talking to them about danger. We're not necessarily being role models for our kids in cyberspace. So the whole mission of the Sinja is to let kids know that just like in the real world, just like on the playgrounds, walking down the street, that not everything is safe. And so we look to empower and inspire kids to make good choices and to understand that part of having a digital life is locking your device, it's using a password, it's not clicking on links, so that they get these lessons taught to them when they're young, and they know in order to be an awesome person, individual in cyberspace, this is just a part of life and what you do. So they don't have, so these kids don't have to go through the learning curve that you and I have, and hopefully they don't have to experience some of the same lessons that we've learned the hard way. Let's hope not. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We've been talking with Heather Dahl, co-founder of the Sinja and chairman of the MPF Board of Directors. You're watching us from the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios at the National Press Foundation, where we are making good journalists better.